Welcome to today's Energy Central webcast entitled, Scott Madden's Energy Industry Update, Recalibration. A few housekeeping notes we'd like to mention. Uh, for best results in viewing the presentation, we recommend using a wired high-speed internet connection, as wireless connections can be unpredictable. If you cannot get adequate sound from your computer speakers, you may dial in using the telephone number in the interface on the right-hand side. Following the presentation, we'll have a brief question and answer period. You may submit your questions at any time using the interface on your screen. Now I'm happy to turn the floor over to our first panelist, our moderator and partner with Scott Madden, Stuart Pearman. Stuart, welcome to the event. You have the floor. Thank you, PJ. Thanks everyone for joining our webinar. Our energy experts will work to try and make this insightful and useful for you. The, the webinar is drawn from our Scott Madden Energy Industry Update. We recently re released it to about 10,000 industry leaders. Thank you to those of you we've already heard back from. We love putting it together for you, and we really enjoy the leadership and board discussions that we facilitate for many of you. If you've joined us for these webcasts before, or you read the update, you know we always have a theme. And no, our cover, Recalibration, is not an homage to Tom Wolfe and the electric Kool-Aid acid test, although he was a special author and a man in full. Instead, it was inspired by analog TV cameras. The way analog TV cameras work is they've actually got four intertwined signals, red, blue, green, and luminance, or light. And if a camera gets out of registration, you get a picture like this, multiple images. It, today, we see multiple images, multiple visions, multiple models as our industry evolves. And so it's time for us as an industry to recalibrate as we create the next new normal together. Today's webcast can't cover everything that we put in the update. For that, you'd have to click the link at the end of our deck or visit our website. The price is right, it's free. So we've chosen three topics for you that we thought might be interesting. First, Paul Quinlan will talk about corporates procuring renewables. This is a big and growing trend and has proved a bit trickier than people thought at first. Then Preston Fowler will talk about the clean power plan, the long strange road that we've been on, where we are now, and maybe look around the corner to see what lies ahead. And then lastly, Kevin Hernandez will give us a survey course on storage, everything you always wanted to know, but we're afraid to ask. Lastly, please send us your questions as we go along, as PJ mentioned, using the, the chat box. With the help of Greg Leitra, partner and energy clean tech and sustainability research leader, we'll field uh, some of them at the end of the webcast. So, Paul, I'm a corporate and I want renewables. Easy peasy, right? Thank you, Stuart. You'd think it'd be easy peasy, but there are some important complexities that may not be obvious. During this segment of the webinar, we'll address a couple of items. We'll quickly provide an overview of procurement options for you, corporate corporations. We'll look at corporate renewable PPA market trends, and then also types of PPA, common types of PPA structures, and then how these corporations may market renewable PPAs to customers. So let's begin with renewable energy procurement options. This slide highlights the diversity of options available to corporations looking to procure renewable electricity. The simplest option is going to be going into the market and purchasing unbundled RECs. Now in the US, Texas has some of the, the cheapest RECs at most recent prices are currently going for just under a dollar per REC. However, some corporations want their investment to be either on the same electricity grid or be as a result of their investments for new renewable energy development. So companies interested in those, those drivers may want to consider some other options. One might be on-site generation. Uh, this could be typically would be a solar facility. Uh, the corporation could own the system themselves or some states lease it from a third party owner. Corporations could also look to utility green tariffs. This would be partnering with the local utility that offers an option for them to source uh, green power, but the transaction is run through the, the local utility. And then finally, a fourth option would be for a company to go and sign a power purchase agreement directly with the renewable energy project. And so let's look more closely at corporate renewable PPA market trends. 
And on this slide here, you can see annual U.S. renewable capacity contracted by corporations. And this chart shows us that things really got a toehold in 2013. Uh, and then 2015 was, was a banner year. And if you look at this chart, you might think we've, we've pulled back from 2015. But what's noteworthy is that 2015 was a year where the investment tax credit and production tax credit were set to expire. So there was a lot of activity, development, and contracts signed that year to make sure projects were eligible for the ITC and PTC. So that, that year is a bit of an outlier. So overall, we see pretty strong growth going forward. Um, even here in 2018, we're off to a very, very early start. Some of the recent announcements that have come out this year is Nike signing a PPA for 86 megawatts of wind in Texas. You have Kohler, the Sync Company, signing a PPA for 100 megawatts of wind in Kansas. AT&T signing PPAs for 520 megawatts of winds in Texas and Oklahoma. And then Microsoft has signed a PPA for 315 megawatts of solar in Virginia. And that contract is the largest solar corporate PPA that has been signed in the U.S. at this time. So with these and other cumulative announcements, where our contracted capacity in the U.S. now exceeds 12 gigawatts. And so we've got a strong start, and this trend is likely to continue. There's a, a few initiatives out there that are likely to drive this further. One is uh, a group called the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance. And this is a group that's working to help corporations purchase 60 gigawatts of additional renewable energy capacity in the United States. There's also an initiative called RE100. And RE100 is a commitment by corporations to procure 100% of electricity from renewable resources. Uh, this initiative has now tracked over 130 global companies, and what's interesting amongst their roster is the diversity of companies. It's not surprising to see big tech names like Apple, Facebook, or Google, but they have a growing list of finance companies that include Bank of America, Citi, Goldman Sachs, Visa, and Wells Fargo. There's also a number of consumer good companies on the list. Starbucks, Nike, or even Coca-Cola may not be surprising, but the list also includes Johnson Johnson, Kellogg's, Procter & Gamble, and Unilever. And there's even manufacturing companies on the list, Schneider Electric, GM, and a Fortune 500 company called BF Corporation, which is a clothing company with brands like Jansport, The North Face, Lee, and Wrangler. So we've seen uh, a lot of activity here. This is a chart that shows renewable contract volume in 2017 uh, by companies. So some of those companies that I, that I mentioned are on this list here. And there's, there's two notable takeaways from this chart. The first is the technology companies on this list. They were some of the, the early drivers here, biggest adopters. Uh, and so they, Facebook, Google, and Apple are all kind of in the top four slots on this chart for, for activity in 2017. The second thing that's noteworthy on this chart is that most of these contracts are wind. So wind generally has a lower levelized cost of energy when you compare it to solar. And corporations looking for the best deal have historically gravitated towards wind deals especially as indicated in this, this chart here. So overall, we've seen a lot of activity in recent years, and the market segment is poised for additional growth. But how are these contact, contracts actually structured? And in general, there are two types of corporate renewable PPAs. The first is a physical or sleeved PPA, and the second is a virtual or synthetic PPA. So we're going to walk through each of these structures now, one at a time. So the first one we'll look at is physical or sleeved PPAs, and these are generally designed to provide a contract path for the physical delivery of renewable energy all the way to the corporate buyer. So as this image shows, it starts with a PPA being signed between the developer and the corporate buyer, and under this contract, the energy moves from the developer to the utility, or in some cases, an energy service provider, and is ultimately delivered to the corporate buyer. Uh, the electricity will be bundled with the RECs, so the corporate buyer receives ownership of the renewable and environmental attributes as well. And those are sh shown in the, the lines on the top of this chart. With the physical PPA, a second contract would also exist between the utility or energy service provider and the corporate buyer. This second contract would pay the utility or, or energy service provider a sleeving fee, which then also authorizes the entity to offtake and manage the energy and covers transmission costs. So as seen as the, in the bottom line on this chart, the corporate buyer would also pay the developer the predetermined PPA price. So these contracts work best for a single facility within the same electric 
region or grid uh, is when these contracts would be most useful. Um, however, if you're a, a, a facility in California and you're interested in contracting with Kansas Wind, this is going to be uh, challenging and have its limitations. And so the other structure that, that we see is virtual or synthetic PPAs, and these provide more flexibility uh, in that they avoid the complexity of a set of contracts for the physical delivery of energy. So you'll notice from this graph, there's more lines, and we'll walk through these. And ultimately, a virtual PPA is structured as a contract for differences. This is providing a renewable energy project a floor price for its electric power. And in this arrangement, the corporate buyer will sign a contract with a renewable project for energy and RECs at a fixed rate or strike price. However, the energy that is contracted here is not physically delivered. Instead, the renewable project will sell energy into the wholesale market and receives a market payment. And on the other side, the corporation will buy and purchase electricity from their normal provider, whether it's utility or energy service provider. So you see this in the, the top two rows of lines on the chart. However, the PPA is virtual because the contract is settled financially between the corporate buyer and renewable project on a net basis, such as once a month. So to, to illustrate this and maybe put a little context around it, let's assume a corporate buyer agrees to buy power at a strike price of $50 per megawatt hour. And it's a hot month and wholesale price is averaged $60 per megawatt hour. In this circumstance, the developer, renewable energy developer, owes the corporate buyer that $10 per megawatt hour difference for every megawatt hour produced. However, for settlement payments, they can also go the other way as indicated on the chart here. If wholesale power would be below the strike price of $50, uh, say it was a, a light month and average prices were actually 40, if the, the $10 per megawatt hour would go the other way. The corporate buyer would need to fulfill the renewable energy developer up to that floor price of, 40, of, of $50 a megawatt hour. So settlement payments can go both, way, both ways. However, Rex, as you can see from the chart, always go from the renewable energy developer to the corporate buyer. So what, what's maybe important to, to note here is that uh, PP, corporate PPAs uh, are good at reducing energy price volatility. It's known what the, the price point will be for the corporate buyer. But depending on market dynamics and contract, contract structure, it does not necessarily guarantee the lowest price for the corporate buyer. So where these will typically come in is corporate virtual PPAs are really good at offsetting load at multiple locations or when the buyer and seller are not in the same electric region or market. So to think about what some of the implications are and unique risks, risks are, there's three maybe worth mentioning today. One is accounting risk. Virtual, and we're just talking about virtual PPAs at this point, not the physical ones. The virtual PPAs, um, what can happen is if this may trigger derivative accounting. So corporations going down this path will often pull in their accounting department early. Uh, if you do trigger derivative accounting, the contracts will, could go on the balance sheet and require uh, regularly being marked to market. And so this is often uh, avoided if possible in early, in structuring the contract early. The second uh, risk is worth noting is basis risk. Basis risk represents the price differential between the node where the price enters the electric grid and the trading hub where the contract may be settled. So some early corporate buyers experience basis risk as nodal prices have dropped with higher penetrations of renewables. To ensure the, the floor price for the renewable project, it's the corporate buyer that has to cover that difference in those settlement payments. So to avoid this risk going forward, many corporations are now looking for contracts in markets with less uh, renewable penetration. And the final risk worth noting is power price risk. And this is really an example I provided before where the market price drops below the strike price and the corporate buyer has to pay the renewable energy project the difference. This chart here shows how that, that risk may come about. The, the orange line is a proxy for wholesale prices in Texas. Uh, from 2015, it's based on some EIA data. If a corporate PPA uh, purchaser was, was building their contract around that assumption for energy prices, if you fast forward three years, the yellow line shows what it actually is in 2018, and there's a significant drop 
and uh, forecasted wholesale power prices as a result, and that risk can, can live with the corporate buyer as a result. A few implications to discuss. Uh, one is uh, supply chain. The, the big area where this is going next is into the supply chain. Many companies have um, met their initial obligations, and they're now looking at where the next frontier is, and they want to push this into the supply chain and help their suppliers go down this road. As a result, and not surprisingly, we see a lot of service providers um, specializing in this and now. Energy service providers are now happy to uh, help their corporate buyers with finding renewable resources. And there's matchmaking platforms that are also arising that are trying to work with smaller companies and aggregate them up and match them to a renewable project. And finally, uh, system planning as well has also come up in conversations. Um, Corporate buyers are, are looking for locations where the deals are going to be the best for them, and this new capacity is being directed to those areas as a, rather than locations that may align with traditional system planning. So that is something else that has come up in early conversations as well as this market grows. So finally, to, to, to bring this home all the way to the end consumer, uh, we'll look at how um, corporations may market their, their, their efforts to customers. And so since 1996, the FTC has issued green guides, uh, which are designed to help marketers avoid making misleading environmental claims. And it should be no surprise that there is some, some guidance around renewable energy claims. And in order to claim that a product is made with renewable energy, all processes must be powered with renewable energy or non-renewable energy matched with RECs. So you see three scenarios on this chart here. And the first one, a product is manufactured and assembled with on-site renewable energy, and those RECs are retired by the company. So the company may make the claim that the product was made with 100% renewable energy. In the second scenario, only the assembly portion was done with renewable energy, and those RECs are retired again. And so the claim that the company can make is that um, the product was assembled with 100% renewable energy, not necessarily uh, fully made. And then the, the final third scenario here, you see again, uh, renewable energy was used initially to manufacture and assemble the product, but the, the company sells the RECs to a third party. And so with that sale, uh, that sale also transferred the environmental and renewable attributes to the third party. So the, the, the company that's manufacturing and assembling this product can no longer make any claims related to renewable energy. So with that, I'll, I will stop there. I look forward to questions, and I will turn the floor back over to Stuart Fearman. Thank you, Paul. Preston, as Yogi Berra would say, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. I am not sure anyone would have predicted we would arrive at quite this fork in the road with the Clean Power Plan. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about how we got here, where, where the hell we are, and what we should look out for going forward? Uh, Sure. Thank you, Stuart. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here today to talk with you about the repeal and possible replacement of the current clean power plan and what may happen next. To understand what lies ahead, I feel that it is important to take a quick look at the long, strange road that has gotten us to this point. In April 2007, Massachusetts, with other states and cities and organizations, challenged the EPA, arguing that the EPA was obligated to regulate greenhouse gases. The case made it to the Supreme Court where justices ruled that e the EPA can regulate greenhouse gas emissions, in this case from auto tailpipes, as a pollutant under the Clean Air Act. On December 15, 2009, the EPA issued an endangerment finding that states that current and projected concentrations of the six key greenhouse gases, of which CO2 is one, threaten public health and welfare. Next, on June 20, 2011, the American Electric Power versus Connecticut Supreme Court case held that corporations cannot be sued for greenhouse gas emissions as a nuisance under federal law, primarily because the Clean Air Act delegates the reg regulation of CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions to the EPA. In August 2015, the EPA announced the Final Clean Power Plan, or CPP. Initial compliance plans were due in 2016, and final plans would have been due this year. Initial compliance would have begun in 2022 with a ramp up towards 2030 emissions goals. Legal challenges began when the rule was published in the Federal Register. In February 2016, the U.S. Supreme Court granted a stay of 
the rule halting implementation of the CPP as CPP-related litigation worked its way through the courts. In September of 2016, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit held a seven-hour en banc hearing on the merits of the Clean Power Plan. In March 2017, President Trump signed an executive order calling for the EPA to review the Clean Power Plan and, if appropriate, suspend, revise, or rescind what he characterized as a burdensome regulation. As a result of that executive order, the EPA issued a notice of proposed rulemaking to repeal the CPP in October. In December of last year, the EPA released an advance notice of proposed rulemaking to solicit public input on a possible replacement for that clean power plan. Comments were due in late February of this year, followed by an April due date for comments of the repeal proposal. Although the EPA has not confirmed it, many industry observers suggest the repeal and replacement rules will be issued by December of this year. This would allow for finalization during President Trump's first term. As you can see, a lot has happened to lead us down this long, strange road. So now let's discuss the EPA proposal to repeal the CPP. As I previously mentioned, the EPA proposed a rule to repeal the Clean Power Plan. Up to that point, the plan had been embroiled in litigation. Those court cases center on a few key points echoed in the EPA's new interpretation of the Clean Air Act. The two biggest issues, one, the current rule's interpretation of the Best System for Emissions Reduction, or BEZER, was too broad in its application. And two, the Clean Power Plan stepped on the state's jurisdiction over energy policy. As for the BEZER, many argue that the CPP regulates emissions from one thing with rules about another. The BEZER was expanded to encompass the state's entire generation portfolio, including energy efficiency and renewable generation. According to some of those challenging the CPP, the best system for emission reduction has historically referred to something at the source of the emissions. Some challengers and the current EPA maintain the plan overreached on the application of BEZER to include things outside the fence of the emitting source and requires shifting of generation away from the emitting source as a means of compliance. Without this generation shifting, the EPA argues that the current clean power plan cannot work, and even if the outside the fence building blocks were removed, there's no assurance that compliance could be met. Additionally, the EPA states that requiring generation shifting for compliance impedes individual states from setting their own energy policy and requirements for greenhouse gas emissions. Although some environmental organizations and states challenge the adequacy of analysis behind the repeal, others are in a wait and see mode. Now let's take a closer look at the regulatory impact analysis. Um, when the EPA issued the repeal notice, they all issued a new incremental they also issued a new incremental regulatory impact analysis. It looked at the cost and benefits for repealing the current plan. The EPA made several changes to the underlying assumptions that significantly impacted the results. I wanna briefly discuss a few of those with you today. The first change is that the new analysis counts only benefits directly tied to the United States, whereas the previous administration had included global benefits in its calculation. This had the effect of lowering the social cost of carbon. Next, the new analysis switches energy efficiency from a cost reduction to a benefit, but the EPA asserts the switch does not have a real net effect on the analysis since these effects are shifted from a, to a foregone benefit instead of a cost savings. The last point I want to highlight is that the EPA revised the health co-benefits analysis by lowering the risk associated with particulate matter in ozone at levels below already established standards, for example, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. The agency estimates all of its adjustments create a $33 billion savings as opposed to its previous calculations of $8.4 billion. This increase makes the analysis for repeal more positive in several, although not all, scenarios. Although there is and will continue to be a lot of debate on how to calculate both benefits and costs, all parties are waiting on the final analysis to determine next steps. So let's shift the discussion to what a possible replacement looks like and identify some key considerations for any new rule. With the issuance of its notice for possible successor to the Clean Power Plan, the EPA laid out a series of questions and considerations for promulgation of a successor rule for the regulation of CO2 emissions from existing generating units. In the notice, the EPA acknowledged the Supreme Court decision in Massachusetts versus EPA. While some states and industry advocates have urged the EPA to reverse that endangerment finding, the EPA did not explicitly question its jurisdiction to regulate greenhouse gases 
in the advance notice, paving the way for a clean power plant successor. In addition, Section 111D of the Clean Air Act specifies that states take the first cut at standards of performance and implementation and then enforcement. The EPA used the advance notice to seek comments on roles, responsibilities, and limitations of state and federal governments. This included details on the appropriate scope of a rule and associated technologies and approaches. Many wonder how to determine the appropriate scope and balance between state and federal rules with any proposed replacement. The spectrum of possibilities ranges from limiting the EPA's role to developing procedures and requirements to guide states, all the way to having the EPA set performance standards for each power plant. Any replacement could give states too much or too little control over implementation and adherence. As I discussed previously, a central concern is how to clearly define what the best system of emission reduction can be applied to. Is it just the emitting asset, i.e. inside the fence, as the current EPA contends, or can it be applied to a portfolio of assets as it was in the existing CPP? Based on comments, this appears to be a sticking point for many proponents of the existing clean power plan who say that limiting the scope of Beezer will likely lessen the emissions reduction of any new plan. However, some supporters of the replacement believe this new interpretation more closely mimics past EPA practices. The EPA requested comments on several other important items before establishing any new revised guidelines for existing generating units. They specifically asked if presumptively approvable emission guidelines were a good idea or not. Next, they are looking at what, into what defines an affected asset. For example, is it a megawatt capacity, technology type, or another criterion? The EPA did acknowledge that improving the heat rate of the assets may result in what is being called a rebound effect, where those assets are now running more and asked ways to mitigate this effect. In addition, the EPA asked for ways for the new standard to be implemented, for example, rate-based or mass-based, and if the states have flexibility with implementation and compliance. As with most rulemaking proceedings, this is not going to be a quick process. So without certainty of a near-term outcome, what have the states and cities been doing? Recent events, including the withdrawal from the Paris Agreement and Clean Power Plan repeal, have led to more local action. States and cities have continued to pursue both greenhouse gas reduction and, in many cases, voluntary action consistent with the goals of the Paris Agreement. As of early October 2017, 20, cities and 100, 20 U.S. states and 110 U.S. cities had enacted greenhouse gas targets. This includes California's extension of its existing cap and trade program with a target of 40% reduction from 1990 levels by 2030. New Jersey and Virginia are considering being a part of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, a move that could be completed by 2020. Also, Virginia's governor instructed the Department of Environmental Quality to develop regulations to reduce carbon emissions from power plants. Other states continue to pursue greenhouse gas reductions through renewable portfolio standards. Hawaii, for example, has become the first state in the nation to commit to achieve 100% renewable electricity by 2045, with interim targets of 30% by 2020, 40% by 2030, and 70% by 2040. It is obvious that local and state governments refuse to wait on the federal government. With all this pressure on the power generation industry, will the clean power plan really matter to the current fossil fuel generators. Although questions surround the implementation of the Clean Power Plan, companies have retired or plan to retire more than 60 gigawatts of coal generation by 2021. That's more than 19% of the 2011 coal fleet capacity. And more than 80% of those retirements are now complete. Price pressure from gas fired power generation and zero marginal cost renewables, along with the cost of compliance with environmental rules such as MAPS, has driven out smaller, less efficient coal-fired units. Instead of retiring, some plants are repowering with using natural gas and to a lesser extent biomass. More than 14 and a half gigawatts of proposed, have been proposed or completed conversions since 2011. So what happens with the remaining assets? To better compete, especially in market-driven areas, generation plants, especially coal units, will need to continue to improve their heat rates. A majority of the remaining units have heat rates of greater than 10,000 BTUs per kilowatt hour. The average, as a point of reference, the average estimated heat rates in PGM between January and September of last year were 6,600 BTUs per kilowatt hours for combined cycle units and 
9,200 BTUs per kilowatt hour for coal plants. Many proponents of the repeal say they're concerned about grid stability and resilience if large baseload generating assets are taken offline. But there are no concrete figures on how much current fossil fuel generation might need to remain for grid stability or resilience once that is defined, pending a replacement with other resources. Interestingly, Southern Company recently announced that its generation fleet will be low to no carbon by 2050. Fossil fuel generation could still exist in 2050, but it'll probably be natural gas, not coal, and include a way to capture a store and store CO2. As the process unfolds, here are a few key items to keep our eyes on. It will be very important to see the final details of the regulatory impact analysis. We need, we'll need to see how the states with diverse constituencies on greenhouse gas regulation react in response to the outcome, and what is the impact will be continued development in the power generation sector. Even though the EPA has issued an advance notice for the replacement, the agency is not required to act, so we will need to wait to see if the new rule is issued and what it looks like. We are also watching the FERC resilience proceeding and consideration by FERC and RTOs of price formation and market rules. And lastly, there's almost certain litigation to any EPA repeal rulemaking, even if a replacement is offered. It certainly has been a wild ride so far, and it doesn't look like it will slow down anytime soon. But I hope that everyone's gained a little better understanding of how we got here, what lies ahead for the clean power plan. Now I'd like to turn it back over to Stuart. Thank you, Preston. It'll be interesting to see how this unfolds. Now, Kevin, more trade press ink than you can shake a stick at is being billed over storage, uh, more than almost any other topic. Can you give us the Cliff's notes and help us understand what's hype and what's really happening and now and how models might evolve in the future? Thank you, Stuart. Uh, I'd be happy to. Um, in, th in this section, we'll share some of our observations on storage and, and talk about some of those trends, uh, particularly the ones we think are really important to the industry. Um, when we talk about storage with our clients, uh, we tend to, to look at it in terms of, of what the storage can do, uh, what applications it can perform on the system, and, and the services it can provide. Uh, for us, really, the value of storage is, is in its ability to perform those variety of applications. Uh, across the power system, whether those are at the uh, residential level, as a customer resource, uh, as a grid resource, or even as a bulk system resource, both uh, behind and in front of the meter, um, oftentimes um, this, is, this is a single asset um, that's providing those multiple services and providing that value. Um, this can present a bit of a challenge when it comes to categorizing, uh, categorizing storage uh, under current wholesale uh, rules. Um, whether it's considered a generation, transmission, or distribution asset, uh, it's a little bit up in the air, and as a result, uh, we, we think that the issue of asset classification has likely slowed adoption in some circumstances, although the, uh, the recent FERC order 841 um, may be mitigating that to some degree. Uh, on this slide, um, you can see a few of the applications that can be provided by storage, uh, each level of the system, and in blue, a few that we think are particularly uh, uh, captivating and, and ones worth watching. And we'll go through and, and talk a little bit about those as we go. On the, uh, the next slide, we talk a little bit about value stacking. And, you know, I think it's hard to have a conversation around storage without talking about uh, value stacking. It seems to be one of those buzzwords in the industry that really gets a lot of attention. Uh, but what I think is, is new about this and is that until recently, value stacking was really seen as necessary to make the economics of storage work out. Uh, the asset would have to perform more than one service in order to make the, the storage system cost effective. And you can see in our graphic on the slide, a notional portfolio of value streams, uh, each of which by itself is really unable to provide a cost beneficial use case relative to the cost of the system. Uh, but when stacked together, are able to provide positive value. Uh, however, as, as costs continue to, to uh, decline year over year, we're now beginning to see more and more instances of single applications uh, that are becoming more cost effective on their own. And we'll talk about some of those as we go, um, particularly on the next slide. Um, but one thing I'd like to point out is that um, I think one of the conclusions that can be drawn from this is that value stacking might become less important uh, if those single applications are cost beneficial. Um, but that's not necessarily what we're seeing in the industry. Uh, rather, while uh, it's maybe not necessary to stack values to get the cost benefit relationship, uh, we're still seeing utilities and developers continue to seek out value stacking. 
as an additional revenue stream and in some cases as a mechanism to spread benefits among multiple stakeholders. So we're often asked when we think storage will be in the money and in our view on storage is that uh, it's in the money today, albeit in specific locations, uh, specific applications, and specific markets. Um, beginning at the top left, I want to run through a couple of those with you. Um, beginning in the top left with ancillary services, uh, I think this is one that's fairly well known. Um, this is really speaking to the uh, ancillary services market in PJM, which is really one of the first purely economical um, energy storage um, applications. Uh, and really drove the overwhelming majority of front-of-the-meter applications that we saw in the country uh, until re relatively recently when market rules changed just a bit. Um, that being said, we believe wholesale markets will continue to be an opportunity for storage, um, particularly with FERC 841, uh, which we think will drive economics for storage in RTOs and ISOs, uh, and that will be implemented, I believe, in just a little bit over a year and a half from now. Uh, moving clockwise, um, the demand charge reduction uh, use case primarily for CNI customers continues to be a cost-effective application somewhere some areas um, This has really been evident. I think in California where the behind the meter demand charge reduction market has led to the largest behind the meter market in the country um, however, as I mentioned before uh, Demand charge reduction as a standalone application is really dependent on the regions where the tariff structure supports it such as California uh, other states such as New York um, Colorado Massachusetts with demand charges um, at or above around $40 a kilowatt. Um, one last item to note here is the number of rate reform initiatives that are going on around the country, um, particularly those looking at residential demand charges and what impact they might have on this business case. Uh, continuing around to the bottom right, um, the T&D deferral application is another specific application for storage that we think is in the money today and has really been driven um, in a couple of markets by regulatory reforms, and in some cases on a purely economic basis. Uh, the deferral of traditional wire solutions using storage um, to mitigate system needs is proving to be, again, on a case-by-case -case basis, um, one of the easier ones to do the cost-benefit uh, analysis on simply because you have a deferred uh, T or D asset for which to, uh, uh, to do the, uh, the benefit analysis from. Um, projects such as APS's Pumpkin Center project and some, uh, a variety of NWA RFPs that are coming out of New York as part of the REV initiative uh, are making NWAs and T&D deferral a much more common uh, use case. Um, that being said, again, these are often very project and site specific and, and highly dependent on the cost of the traditional solution. Uh, lastly, um, and perhaps one of the more controversial in the money applications for storage we're seeing is the use of storage when paired with renewable generation, such as solar, um, as, a, as a peaking resource. And while, again, this is very highly dependent on local um, project economics, uh, we've seen growing interest um, in, among regulators and others for using solar plus storage uh, to replace gas peakers. Um, that being said, generally we don't see the conflict uh, between storage and peakers. Uh, and much of what we read recently in the trade press seems to blow this issue just a bit out of proportion. Um, as we look at the next uh, slide, uh, geographically, where storage has taken off, we spoke to this just a bit ago, is really uh, uh, in California with the behind the meter demand charge reduction uh, application and the frequency regulation market in PJM. However, in the last year, we've really seen a flurry of activity among state commissions and legislatures they're aimed at driving development of energy storage uh, really across the country. Uh, the announcement by Governor Cuomo in New York at the beginning of the year for a 1.5 gigawatt target by 2030, um, potential clean peak standards in California, Massachusetts, and Arizona would impact storage. Uh, and then inclusion in storage, uh, of storage rather, as an integrated, uh, uh, as a resource and integrated resource plants in Washington State, New Mexico, it's particularly interesting. And then last but not least, uh, the announcement uh, a week or two ago by Governor Murphy in New Jersey for a two gigawatt target by 2030 um, was uh, particularly eye raising. Uh, other developments include studies, uh, Nevada and North Carolina are doing those and financial incentives in Maryland and Hawaii. Uh, what's notable among all of these is the degree to which regulators and lawmakers are leading the charge to incorporate storage at a state level. Um, Taking one state in particular, uh, we'd like to focus just a bit on Hawaii, or I'm sorry, in New York. And one state that we believe is really important to keep tabs on uh, as we look at storage this year. As I mentioned on the last slide, the 1.5 gigawatt target was set earlier this year. Um, caught a lot of attention, but there's a lot going on beyond just that target worth taking note of. 
Uh, to begin, uh, the New York ISO has been working, developing a roadmap for the inclusion of storage in their wholesale markets. Uh, they released a state of storage report in December of 2017. And I believe we're working towards a, an energy storage roadmap by the end of the year. Um, complementing that effort, uh, the New York State Energy Research and Development Agency, or NYSERDA, in partnership with the Public Utilities Commission in New York, are working towards a similar energy storage roadmap, also by the end of uh, 2018. And those efforts um, may not be realized by all, but are in addition to a, a pre-existing two-system mandate that all publicly owned utilities have to put two storage systems uh, on their distribution networks by the end of this year. Um, that being said, what we think is really might make 2018 the interesting, you know, really interesting year for storage in New York is the inclusion of standalone storage in the state's value stack tariff. Uh, the value stack is a compensation mechanism for DERs uh, intended to replace net metering effectively. Um, the, the initial tariff that was rolled out last year included provisions for storage plus solar, uh, but there is work going on um, in a current proceeding to include standalone storage in that. And how the commission determines how to compensate storage as a DER, uh, we believe could serve as a model for evaluating storage uh, nationwide. On the next slide, uh, we want to talk a little bit more, go back uh, and talk a little bit about storage as a non wires alternative. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that because it's of the implication it has for utilities. Um, because non wires alternatives are typically procured through solicitation processes, uh, we've seen that the procurement of storage has really emerged as a particular challenge. Um, many of whom, uh, many of our uh, of utilities have limited experience. Um, with storage, and as a result, RFP process and the selection process could be pretty tricky. Storage as a technology doesn't help, and comparing those proposals on an apples to apples basis um, can be quite a challenge. Uh, also, because, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, because NWAs um, and storage generally has to be compared on a cost benefit basis, uh, performing those benefit cost analysis uh, has emerged in the challenge, um, in no small part to the fact that most uh, NWAs are deferrals. Um, only deferrals of capital expenditures and not necessarily all in all um, out replacements. Uh, and then lastly, you know, we found that the real secret to success in utilizing storage as an NWA lies in its integration with the capital planning process. Um, and Paul spoke to this a little bit earlier, um, how important it is. Um, and in this case, you know, defining early on the load forecasting and planning cycles uh, projects for which there may be an opportunity to defer a project for later. Um, really is important. And when integrated in this way as a tool in the planner's toolkit, storage can really be best leveraged as a, as a non-wire solution. Uh, in terms of procurement, one of the things that makes um, NWA a challenge is just the, the nature of the entry storage value chain. So I just wanted to share with you uh, how we think about that. Uh, we tend to think about it in, in three primary categories. Uh, the upstream OEMs that produce batteries, balance assist components, storage control systems. Uh, midstream developers and integrators who are piecing together systems for sale and, and developing projects. And then downstream end users of energy storage, which uh, other than being consumers, also largely overlap with the applications. Um, at this point, uh, many utilities are maturity de uh, dealing with storage of resource are working primarily with developers and integrators um, who bring to the table knowledge of the systems and components and are willing to, to partner with them on, on some business models, which we'll discuss in a moment. Um, however, as time goes by, we expect to see a lot of consolidation uh, in the value chain, uh, primarily as bigger systems integrators move upstream in an effort to differentiate themselves um, on a basis other than just simply being the lowest cost of the bidder. Um, common business models, um, we spoke to this just a moment ago, um, we we're talking about the developers and integrators, but a couple of the ones that we're seeing that are most prevalent uh, are here on this slide, and I'll just walk you through these quickly. Um, on the top left, the turnkey or utility-owned systems, it's the most straightforward arrangement, um, but not one that we're seeing um, uh, as commonly. Uh, this would be where a developer or integrator sells the system directly to the utility, which would own and operate the system. Uh, oftentimes, there's an O&M arrangement with the developer. Um, tolling, tolling agreements is, or storage as a service is much more common, uh, where the utility may be contracting for um, some portion of capacity. Um, below that, uh, merchant storage. This is the IPP model, and this is what we saw a lot in PJM uh, with the front of the meter and um, frequency response market. And then lastly, the PPA, what has evolved from a PPA, the renewable PPA, is more of a capacity agreement for storage. 
And what we think is going to happen here is we'll continue to see uh, some gravitation towards utility ownership as utilities move up the tree curve, which I'll speak to in a moment, as well as um, continued merchant storage as uh, 841 opens up those wholesale market opportunities. And then lastly, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about the uh, energy storage maturity model and, and how we've seen storage uh, um, mature through utilities. Uh, the transition to utility ownership is one we think is really inevitable. Uh, from a utility perspective, we think that storage presents a real opportunity, and time will become a fundamental technology in how the grid's managed. Um, however, uh, we're not there yet, and many of the utilities we've worked with are still in the early stages of the maturity curve, you know, primarily working with third-party partners uh, to establish pilots or demonstration projects uh, for the, uh, the purpose of, of proving out those storage technologies. Um, Consequently, we think we're really probably closer to five or 10 years out from full-scale utility-owned energy storage, uh, where the storage is, is treated by utilities and regulators and others, much as any other grid asset, and the benefits of which are distributed among all the stakeholders. Um, and with that, uh, I'll wrap this up and pass it back to Stuart. Thank you, Kevin. So thanks for staying with us, and thanks for offering questions. And now we'll field a few. Let me turn it over to Greg Leitra, who leads our research and, uh, and is the principal author of the Scott Madden Energy Industry Update. Greg? Uh, thanks, Stuart. And uh, thank you again, everyone, for, uh, for attending this. Uh, we've had a number of questions come in. And, um, and, uh, and I'll start off, I guess, with Paul. Um, Paul, you mentioned um, green tariffs in your presentation. Um, can you offer uh, any insight into how that market compares to the corporate PPA market? Certainly. So this is uh, an area that also has a lot of interest, but um, uh, the, the green utility tariff market is much, much smaller. So since 2005, there's been about one gigawatt of new renewables brought in line through green tariffs, and that is much smaller than that 12 gigawatts that we, we talked about for corporate renewable PPAs. And, and one of the, the challenges with the utility green tariffs is uh, overwhelmingly uh, they are limited to new load. So if you're a corporation that is signed on to the RE100 initiative, um, a green utility tariff is going to be limiting because uh, you will only in most cases be able to use it for new load that you have on, on the system. Uh, the only utility that we're aware of that allows matches existing load to new renewable generation is Puget Sound Energy. So still a lot of interest there, but a much smaller market uh, at this point in time. Well, thanks. And, and uh, I guess another follow-up that, uh, that came in, um, can you offer some specific examples of companies procuring renewable energy, particularly through corporate PPAs? Sure. So. Um, Two, to, to dive deeper on two that, that get a lot of headlines. One is Google. Um, in 2017, they announced that they purchased enough renewable electricity to offset 100% of their global operations. And it's a big headline number that gets a lot of trade and press and interest. Um, but what's important to note is that it doesn't necessarily match load or even exist on the same electric grid. So they signed corporate PPAs and procured enough megawatt hours to match the total megawatt hours of, of uh, load that they had over the course of the year. They have announced a, a next phase that they're interested in. Uh, moving forward, they intend to make a more uh, regional approach to their procurement to better match where, where their load is occurring. And then they're also looking for resources that better match uh, their load profile. So that's the next step for them. Um, another company that comes to mind touches upon uh, the, the marketing and the RECs that we, we mentioned, um, and you can even do some field research this weekend. So in, AB InBev uh, is the corporate owner of Budweiser, and earlier this year they announced that uh, all Budweiser in the United States is being brewed with wind power from a farm in Oklahoma. And they've gone so far as to actually put a 100% renewable label on their bottles and cans in the U.S. And so it's probably the most prominent example of a company that has taken steps in this area and then actually gone out and marketed that to their, their end consumers with a label on their product. Um, thanks. Um, next question is for, for Kevin. Um, is it true what they're saying um, in some parts of the country, such as California, that gas peakers are dead? Uh, thanks, Greg. Uh, that's a good question. You know, I think when you hear things like that, 
uh, it's important to bear in mind that that um, you know ultimately this is still an, an economic and engineering problem that's that's being worked out um, often in in contentious political forums and uh, we think it's fair to say that in some circumstances uh, storage for solar is giving traditional peaking resources pretty strong run for their money uh, in Arizona earlier this year we saw a solar plus storage facility to beat out a gas peaker in an open R RFP um, however I, I think ultimately um, there's probably more uh, I'm sorry probably less conflict than as I said during our presentation between storage and gas peakers that's that's currently reported on uh, this might be an issue that's overblown just a little bit another question for you uh, Kevin there's been some questions on on storage policy and I guess I'll um, lead in with this uh, this next question is FERC order 841 all that it's cracked up to be and maybe you can start by telling us what that order says yeah absolutely thanks yeah so FERC 841 um, came out early I think believe in February this year requires ISOs and RTOs to establish uh, participation models for energy storage that takes into account the physical and operational characteristics of storage uh, and then facilitates their participation in the wholesale markets um, is it cracked up uh, is it all that it's cracked up to be um, yes and no um, I, I think that it can't be overstated the importance that um, energy storage will have participating um, in the wholesale markets on a level playing field um, providing services in the, in the capacity energy and ancillary services markets um, however um, 841 I don't think will do uh, very much to modify storage economics uh, where costs continue to exceed the potential new revenue streams in other words it's still gonna have to be cost beneficial uh, to participate in those markets and uh, as many may know uh, FERC 841 didn't address the DR aggregation provisions that were part of the original proposed rule and so it seems like FERC may have punted on that issue uh, around dual participation of DERs in retail and wholesale markets which will uh, impact the storage participation as well thank you um, the next question is a, a bit of a leading question is for Preston um, is it economics or regulation that is causing coal plant and that's a good question. Um, the simple answer is both. All the regulation certainly is driven and continues to drive retirements. I think that we cannot overlook impact from economic factors, including low natural gas prices, the increasing penetration of renewable resources, and weak load growth. In wholesale power markets, where the lowest marginal cost resources are the first to be dispatched, electricity from natural gas is often cheaper than coal, which forces those coal plants out of the market. Um, less runtime means lower energy revenues. If the energy revenues are too low, they can't cover costs. It can't be a hard decision for the owner of a merchant coal plant to abandon an asset, but an expectation of continued losses can tip the scales towards that retirement. In the regulated market, coal plants also feel some regulatory pressure from cheap natural gas. You know, regulated utilities have the ability to develop integrated resource plans that retain these resources, but those utilities are facing increasing scrutiny of the cost to customers for coal-fired generation when compared to cheaper gas-fired generation and renewables. You know, then we talk about you know, the penetration of renewables, which have a zero marginal cost, but you know, it's put extraordinary pressure on coal and other thermal power units, which is illustrated in the much talked about duct curve. This has led to the increased cycling of the plants, which hurts their marginal costs due to the increased heat rates and maintenance costs, and also creates something, um, you know, sometimes unfavorable emission profiles during the plants ramping up and ramping down. Finally, weak load growth, coupled with very high reserve margins in most areas, make it harder to hang on to these plants in these markets. There is some ongoing debate about whether this is creative destruction, the old making way for the new, or market failure. Markets are not, are not re rewarding resiliency, and for nuclear, low emissions and prices have been distorted by state public policy like renewable portfolio standards. And battle lines are being drawn. Well, thanks, Preston. Um, now, and the next question is for, for Kevin, um, who has to bring out his crystal ball. Um, is in, and the question is, is 2018 the year that residential storage takes off? Yeah, thanks, Greg. Uh, the, the crystal ball remains just a little bit cloudy. Uh, I, have to, I would have to say that it remains to be seen. Um, popular you know, energy storage forecasts for some time have predicted that uh, behind the meter residential storage market to take off. Uh, that's, that's really 
been the forecast for for a couple of years now. Uh, will 2018 be the year? Um, probably not. I, I tend to think that um, batteries behind the meter and, and residential settings are really competing against. Uh, if, if we assume that they're providing a backup power benefit, or competing against, um, you know not other energy storage technologies, but really against non-incumbent technologies such as um, uh, off-the-shelf off um, commercial diesel generators, uh, which have, of course, a lot more capacity than, uh, than a two to four hour battery storage system. Um, in order for real adoption to occur in the residential space, um, you know, I think it's gonna be post net metering, um, utility rate structures, uh, other types of rate reforms such as residential demand charges, I think those are going to be necessary for making the economics of home energy storage really meaningful enough to drive the demand for those systems. Thanks, Kevin. Um, and one one more question. Um, this one is for Paul. Um, what is the split between virtual PPA, physical PPA, and fleet PPA? And also, are there solar, are solar farms being built with the intention to be a merchant facility? Um, so we never found great data that split that out, uh, but anecdotally what we've seen is that the, um, the, the virtual PPA seems to be more prominent in the marketplace, and in large part that is because of the flexibility that's offered. If you're a large company like Apple or Google, you've got multiple facilities in multiple electric uh, grid uh, areas. And so for the companies that at least have started down this road, those are, are more flexible contracts um, that allow them to, to meet our, their goals. So, so while we, we didn't, don't have uh, real firm numbers on those, everything it seems to indicate that that's the, the more popular approach. Um, Greg, you have to remind me on the second half of that question. Are uh, solar farms being built with the intention to be a merchant? To be a merchant facility? We, uh, we have not seen that necessarily. Um, I believe there is one facility in Texas that has tried to go down that, that route. What we have seen with clients, though, is folks are thinking um, typically they're going to get financing because they have a power purchase agreement and that's going to make the project bankable. But they are thinking through what, what happens on the back end. If a power purchase agreement is 10, 15, or 20 years and they believe the asset is going to be um, workable for 30 or 35 years, they are thinking through what are we going to do on the back end. Uh, that could be another PPA, or that could be a merchant setting on the backside. Um, but in, in 20 years, a lot can can change. Thank you. Well, in the interest of time, I'm going to hand it back to Stuart to, uh, to close us out. Well, thanks, everyone, for your questions. Although that last one for Paul was a little hard. Um, please let us wrap up. On behalf of Paul, Preston, Kevin, Greg and his team, and everyone at Scott Madden, thank you for attending. If you would like to receive the full Scott Madden Energy Industry Update, please click this link and please let us turn turn it back over to PJ so she can close us out. PJ? Thank you, Stuart, and thank you, speakers. Fantastic presentation today. For our audience, we hope you've enjoyed today's discussion. As you log off, please take a moment to complete our survey and give us your feedback so we can continue to provide you with quality content. Thank you for attending. This concludes today's presentation.